we have to discuss what do we actually mean by these two words spiritual and religious the meanings of words are not frozen in a dictionary words have denotations and connotations denotations refers to what they mean literally in a dictionary but connotations refer to what are the associated thoughts emotions and perceptions that certain words bring in people's minds so words have both connotations and denotations and understanding this is important so for example the word wicked uh, till 15 20 30 years ago it meant cruel now if you look in the latest dictionaries the word wicked has a positive spin to it when people have a very enjoyable party they say we had a wicked party <laughs> so <laughs> now if we had a time machine and say a person from 1950 came here and he said hey, you have a wicked party and you are enjoying it they say find it very strange so the meanings of the words keep changing and this is just one example there are many examples that can be given so for example in 19 1900 a famous sanskrit english scholar translated the ramayana into english and the one of the chapters of the ramayana he titled as the rape of sita and when that chap when that book is today read by indians hindus they feel enraged you know there was never any physical violation so if you go back to 100 years at that time the word rape had a different meaning it simply meant abduction it did not mean physical violation so there are many examples we can give like this but the point is words have different implications which people have in their minds which bring which pe- which come in people's minds when they hear the words so what do we mean by spiritual and religious and why are we first of all talking about this topic so actually in america and as american culture is coming in various parts of the world there is a whole group of people who proudly label themselves as sbnr people sbnr is spiritual but not religious they say that we are spiritual people but we are not religious people in fact a famous or infamous atheist has written a book in which he starts by saying i am a spiritual atheist <laughs> now whatever the word spiritual atheist means he only knows that or maybe even he doesn't know that so the point is the word spiritual has certain appealing connotations to it and that's why everyone wants to appropriate the word to themselves and so even atheists want to say that I'm a spiritual atheist and in fact the same atheist in his book considers religion to be one of the greatest evils of society and he says that if he doesn't believe in god but he says if god came in front of me so you know atheists for them god is a very convenient fiction who exists only for the purpose of so that they can give advice to god so god pops into existence to receive advice from them and after receiving their advice gracefully and gratefully god pops back into non existence that is their idea so he said if god came in front of me and i had to and he asked me there's one evil you can remove from the world so he said if you give me a choice between removing rape from the world and removing religion from the world he said i will remove religion from the world so this is such a ghastly idea where one is a brutal crime and the other is actually elevating activity but this is his antipathy antipathy means hatred towards religion of course he is a you could call it a there are we often know about religious fanatics but he is a atheistic fanatic but why i am talking about him here is the same person is ready to call himself as a spiritual atheist and considers religion to be such a great evil that he wants it to be eradicated from the world so what do people have in mind because of which they find sp- the word spiritual attractive and the word religious unattractive so actually in general many people equate re- being religious with being narrow minded you know you believe in something and you think you are right 
and you think that anybody who doesn't agree with your belief they are all wrong they are all foolish in fact worse than foolish they are all going to go to hell and actually there are some people who believe like that unfortunately there are some religious people religionists who do believe like that they say if you don't agree with our beliefs then you are going to go to hell and we will help you get there faster also <laughs> so people equate being religious with being narrow minded with being fanatical and they feel i don't want to be religious another thing people associate with being reli- associate with being religious is being attached to certain externals okay you say that you know you should do like this you should do like that you should go here you should not go there people think religious means it brings just attachment to certain externals and it also brings narrow mindedness we'll talk about this a little later one of the main reasons for this idea is that there has been a significant of violence amount of violence in the name of religion that has happened throughout the world so people feel that you religious people you believe that one person believes this is god another person believes that is god now you have some fight about the other world and you create a fight in this world so <laughs> so they say that you people why do you you are making this world a play is worse than what it should be and some of their points are indeed valid so if religion makes people narrow minded makes people fanatical makes people irrationally aggressive towards others then that sort of religion can be undesirable so when people can think of the word religious they often think of it as narrow minded and that's why they feel i don't want to be religious on the other hand when people think of the word spiritual they often think of the spirit word spiritual as being something being an avenue to new experiences some those who are spiritual yes we are open minded we want to have some new experiences try this out try that out go here go there in fact there are, um there are certain drugs in the 1960s 1970s america witnessed a counter culture and at that time many young americans started searching for spirituality and at that time the no popular notion among them was that one of the ways to become spiritual is by taking psychedelic drugs psychedelic is consciousness altering drugs so there was a drug lsd which was portrayed as having remarkable psychedelic properties which would lead to spiritual states of consciousness so now lsd was a acronym was a short form for a chemical which was called as lsd but these people who tried taking lsd they rechristian renamed lsd as league of spiritual discovery <laughs> <laughs> so all those people who take lsd you know we are belong to the spiritual discoverers group and they said this is a so they said this is a spiritual drug so anything people think that which will give us some new experiences that is spiritual so somebody may say that okay i went to a picnic and that i went to a hill station and i saw the sunrise and i saw the sky and i saw the stars and it was so spiritual so people's idea of being spiritual is simply the idea that something which makes you feel good makes you feel peaceful makes you feel something new that they call as spiritual so now who will not want something like that so if spiritual is as vague as vague as just feeling good feeling new feeling nice then who will not want that so people say yes we want to be spiritual and that's why, and that is what even atheists want so they say yes i am a spiritual atheist so what is this so the idea of spiritual simply means a feel good kind of experience which has no uh ideological or philosophical implication and which has no uh, lifestyle obligation that means you don't have to believe anything you don't have to do anything you just experience now this idea of being spiritual 
So now I have discussed about two things over here. By spiritual, if we just mean being open-minded, and by religious, if we mean being uh, close-minded, then certainly you know, we all would like to be spiritual and not religious. But are these the only meanings of spiritual and religious? Actually, if we look at the uh, Vedic scriptures, they explain spirituality not just in terms of some dogmas. Dogmas mean some beliefs. So the, these people, some of those people who are opposed to religion, they say that actually being religious means what? You only have to do three things. Pay, pray, obey. What is it? You come and pay. Give some donation in the temple or the mosque or the church or the synagogue. Then go and there is some God. You don't even know who that God is, but that doesn't matter. You just pray to him. And then whatever you are told, obey. So people think religion means pay, pray, obey. So now this sort of thing doesn't appeal to thoughtful, intelligent people. People think that this sort of religion is something which I don't want to have anything to do with. But the Vedic scriptures describe that actually spiritual is definitely an experience. But it is a state of consciousness that we can steadily experience. It is not just a one-time experience that we can have. Spiritual is a state of consciousness that can be steadily there. And religion is the process by which we can experience that spiritual state of consciousness. So repeat, spiritual is what? It's a state of consciousness. It's an experience, but not just a, a one-time experience. It's a state of awareness. It's a state of consciousness that can be always there with us. And religion is meant to be a process by which we can rise to that spiritual level of consciousness. And significantly, it is not that there has to be only one way to rise to that level of consciousness. So, if we look at the Vedic understanding of spirituality, Bhagavad Gita in the ninth chapter, second verse, describes that Raja Vidya Raja Guhiyam Pavitram Idam Uttamam Pratyakshavagamam Dharmyam Susukham Kartum Avyayam so, Raja Vidya is the king of knowledge, is, is king of secrets, and most importantly, Krishna says, Pratyakshavagamam Dharmyam. Pratyakshavagamam Dharmyam. So, it is something which one can confirm by direct experience. So, the Bhagavad Gita's understanding of spirituality is very different from pay, pray, obey. Bhagavad Gita's understanding is analyze, realize, and cherish. So analyze, analyze the world around us. You know, Newton saw the fruit falling. Now most people who would have seen the fruit falling, just pick it up the fruit and eat that. <laughs> what, what happened? Newton observed the fruit falling and thought, okay, why is that fruit falling? Isn't it? And then by seeing something which is very easily observable, he started looking for invisible principles. Okay, why does this fruit fall? So from that, he inferred the invisible principle that there is the law of gravity. So, in general, whether it is scientific knowledge or philosophical knowledge, the advancement of knowledge happens when we move from visible facts to invisible principles. I observe certain things in fact, if you look at most of science, people say seeing is believing, but Newton did not stop with that. Seeing is believing. Okay, I saw the fruit falling. See, believe. Yes, I saw fruit falls. That did not lead to the advancement of knowledge. After seeing, there was, and he analyzed. Okay, why is it falling? If we look at most of science, the heart of science is theories. And th none of the theories are things that we can observe. The experiments conducted to verify those theories, they are something we can observe. The results we can observe. But the theories in themselves and even the principles that science talks about, most of them are invisible. So knowledge progresses 
when we move from visible facts to invisible principles that explain those facts so similarly how do how do we uh, move towards spirituality the vedant sutra says athato brahma jigyasa inquire about spiritual truth brahma jigyasa now why would anyone want to inquire about spiritual truth actually all of us have at a very fundamental level an innate longing to live forever to never die and this longing is present not just in us human beings but it is present in all living beings and for uh, atheistic theories which try to explain everything in the universe one of the biggest problems is this longing for life now the idea is that everything has evolved from a lump of chemicals and everything has come just by gradual adaptation so now if we look around us we don't see anything that is permanent everything around us is temporary everything is perishable then the question comes up where does our longing for eternal life come from suppose you came into this temple hall and now the whole floor is made of wood and suddenly you saw a gold coin lying over there actually the question will come this is all wood around here where did the gold coin come from so when we see something which is remarkably different from its surroundings at a particular place we think where has it come from so same way we see everywhere around us things are temporary so where does our longing to live forever come from if we were just creatures who were products of matter then why would we want to live forever when the very thing that we are made of that is the material body it's temporary everything every cell is temporary every organ is temporary then how did temporary matter ever come up with this idea that i want to exist forever this is something which is actually unexplainable by materialism so at a fundamental level asking why do i want to live forever or turning the question around when i want to live forever why do i have to die this question is the seed of spiritual inquiry and all living beings have to die and all living beings try to avoid death but only human beings can question the reason for the existence of death and even they can question the reason for the existence of existence the reason for existence of existence means okay why do i exist so now this mic is there and now it exists but doesn't even know that it exists no a cat or a dog you know it exists but it has no capacity for metaphysical inquiry you know a cat sees a rat it doesn't think why i exist why that exists it just pounces on it isn't it so they are simply driven by their biological drives so we alone can think why do i exist and this guides us towards some higher truth if everything around me is temporary and yet i have a desire to exist forever that means there must be a part of me which exists forever and if i can understand that part if i can realize that part then i also can exist forever so spirituality 
begins with this analysis analysis and we inquire and then when we complement our analysis complement means complete we begin our analysis by this sort of con- uh, thinking and we complete that analysis by turning towards scripture scripture is basically like god's guide book for us when we live in the world we can easily observe that most of our necessities for living are prearranged we certainly have to endeavor we have to have a job so that we can earn a living so that we can have bread on our table that's true but our working in a job does not produce the bread in the field that comes by god's arrangement and even if we work to produce bread but still we don't produce the air that we breathe we don't produce the water that we drink so we actually if we look at life objectively we will find that most of the things that we need in life are provided for so heat light air water food they are provided for so now if god has provided for these things then one important thing for living is knowledge and if if say you have some friend who gives you a very expensive machine which you have never seen and which you don't know what it is and he just gives you the machine and doesn't give you any manual doesn't give you any guide book what will you do with that machine isn't it no if that person cared enough to give such a valuable and expensive machine wouldn't that person care enough to also give a guide book about how to use that machine same way and god has provided so many of our necessities for living one of the necessity of for living is knowledge about the purpose of living so that knowledge is provided by god through the scriptures so initially with our inquiry okay there is a spiritual dimension to my life what is it i want to know about it then we turn towards god uh, the, the scriptures and there we get clearer understanding there we get deeper understanding and the scriptures explain that our present existence is two dimensional we are spirit souls who by nature are eternal but are we are, we are currently inhabiting a physical body and to the extent we identify with the physical body to that extent we suffer the pains that happen in the body that happen to the body as our own pains now television movies this can give us a easy example to understand what this misidentification means sometimes people are watching a movie and in the movie when the say the villain starts beating the hero and sometimes you know people start trembling what happened get shocked or when the hero starts beating the villain people start beating their neighbor <laughs> so what is happening they are identifying with what is happening in the movie and the emotions which are there for the hero they identify with them now suddenly a fight is going on and suddenly the people are let's say suppose the audience is very intensely identifying with the hero and suddenly the villain just takes out a knife stabs and the hero is dead you know people are shocked what happened how did the hero die like this so people to the extent they identify with the uh, character in the movie with the hero to that extent they will experience the emotions of that character so same way when the soul identifies with the body the soul experiences emotions related with the body and when the body is destroyed we feel it as our death but we as souls are eternal so our longing for eternality can be fulfilled when we realize our spiritual identity our our spiritual identity as souls when we realize it then that level of realization that level of consciousness is called as spiritual so the word spiritual refers to understanding ourselves as soul and understanding our relationship with god of whom we are parts and then understanding our relationship with all living beings through that divine relationship so it's a whole different way of looking at the world and now 
this level of consciousness spiritual level of consciousness is something which has to be systematically awakened there is a process for that and to the extent that process is followed to that extent a person can rise to a spiritual level of consciousness now what does it involve you know when people go to watch a movie two things happen if you go in a theater to watch a movie two things happen first is one light goes off and second is another light goes on <laughs> all the lights around they go off and then people forget everything that they are around it is around them so the scriptures call this as avarnatmika shakti avarana covering so when all the lights go on we can't see anything and then one light that is on the screen goes on and then our consciousness gets dragged towards that that is called as the prakshepatmika shakti so our consciousness gets close to everything else and it gets focused on one thing and if we want to get out of the movie so what is to be done first is turn off that light and turn on these lights is the converse of it exactly the so same way when we want to become spiritual there are two aspects to it decrease one's materialism that's like turning off the light which is getting us into the illusion on the screen and second is turn on those acti- or start those activities which revive our spiritual consciousness which remind us about our spiritual identity so coming to the temple studying scriptures are uh, learning with devotees chanting the holy names these are all activities they are not just some religious rituals which some people like to do and say they do it they are actually methods by which we can rise to the spiritual level of consciousness so that's why i said analyze realize so it's not that we just have to do something mindlessly there is a process can you have this so when we follow this process then we actually realize the higher truth so i'll give an example for explaining this by using a analogy from science and then i'll use an analogy more specifically from medicine so spirituality is like a science i mean okay so science if you see it has these two aspects to it there is theory and there is experiment so theory is what tells us okay for an example newton proposed that there is a law of gravity that every particle of matter attracts the other particle of matter with a force that is directly proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distance so this is a theory now at the level of theory we can't know whether it is true or false so that's why there are experiments and the experiments are designed to help us realize verify the theory or the theory is verified already then to demonstrate the theory so similarly if you look at spirituality there is philosophy and there is religion so philosophy is like the theory aspect of science philosophy tells us what is what philosophy will tell us that you are not just a material creature you have a spiritual dimension to your life in fact you are that spiritual being and there is god and we have a eternal relationship with him so all this is told to us by philosophy now at the level of philosophy we can't know whether it is true or it is not true so there is religion so religion is like the experiment aspect of science what religion is meant to do is help us verify the philosophy to help us demonstrate the philosophy so for example if the philosophy tells us that you know, we are souls and we will get real happiness by learning to love and serve god then 
religion offers us means by which we can actually love god so religion for example now when we chant the holy names so what is the purpose of chanting the holy names it is you know, all of us as souls have a eternal connection with god with krishna but you have forgotten that connection and chanting enables us to revive that connection and thereby we re experience the higher spiritual happiness that is actually our nature so religion enables us to verify whatever the philosophy has taught so now if somebody says that i will be spiritual without being religious what is that say like saying you know i will be healthy without going to a doctor now imagine a person who is sick and such a person says that i will be healthy without going to a doctor okay you don't want to go to doctor i will be healthy without taking any medicine also okay that that is unrealistic that person will not be healthy that person will at best be having an illusion of health so same way people who think that i can be spiritual without doing any kind of transformation without following any kind of process for transforming themselves then their spirituality is largely a imagination it may just feel sometimes yeah sometimes i feel good sometimes i feel spiritual but most of the time people will not feel spiritual for very long so uh, these sort of feelings well people feel good and they feel good even in relationship with god but that doesn't last for long why because those feelings there is no process to transform the heart so for example somebody may say uh, come to a uh, come to a hill station before i was introduced to iskon i had gone to a spiritual organize uh, spiritual teachers spirit, uh, spiritual and double codes spiritual teachers class and he told now i will give all of you a spiritual experience okay so all of us were interested what will you do so he said close your eyes imagine that you are sitting on the banks of a river hear the sound of the waves of the river blowing feel the wind blowing through your ears feel the ear hair flying on your head see the mountains on the opposite side feel the black clouds grazing the top of the mountains your limbs are relaxing you are feeling peaceful you are feeling calm you are feeling centered you are spiritual <laughs> so now now you know, some people may actually feel good also because why is that because basically you know if we just try to project ourselves and imagine some nice scene we may feel good but how long will that good feeling last you know we can't live in that imagination throughout our life we have to come back and deal with the realities of life so spirituality is not just some mental conception or some imaginary sentiment it's actually when we connect with a higher reality then the spiritual experience becomes tangible it becomes real if there is a boat on an ocean and and the ocean waves are going to come constantly and those waves will cause the boat to shake and the bigger the waves the greater the shaking now how can that boat stop shaking it has to connect itself to something larger something thicker something bigger so the boat is anchored then the waves may come but the anchor will ensure that the boat will shake lesser and lesser and lesser so same way we are like that boat and this world is like a ocean the vedic scriptures compare this boat to a bhava this world to a bhava sagar the ocean of material existence 
and here there are waves of dualities but there is honor and dishonor there is pleasure and pain there is success and failure you know in one world cup india is the world cup champion the next world cup india doesn't qualify also for the next rounds <laughs> so these things happen It is how there are dualities you know in one world cup a cricketer gets the player of the series award in the next world cup that player is labeled as the villain of the series award <laughs> you know these are the dualities which happen in this world so when these happen what do we do we all will experience them at a smaller or greater scale and we can't just as you can't imagine when the ocean's waves are coming oh the ocean is calm ocean is peaceful it will not work we need to connect ourselves so that anchor with which we can connect is god so in fact god is not only the anchor to which we connect god is also the anchor by which we connect that means when we chant the holy name krishna manifests as the holy name by which we can connect with him so to the extent we chant attentively pray to krishna sing in kirtans then that connects our consciousness with krishna and because krishna is the supremely unchangeable reality the changes the stresses the anxieties of this world don't trouble us anymore and in fact krishna is not just the supremely unchangeable reality krishna is a supremely joyful reality he is one of his names is ram ram means ramati ramayati iti rama ramati means one who enjoys and ramayati is one who gives enjoyment that is ram so when we connect with him we experience higher happiness so spiritual religious is the means the method by which we become spiritual and the vedic scriptures do recognize that there doesn't have to be only one method by which people can become spiritual there are different religions and god himself has given different paths one of the great uh, vaishnava teachers shri bhaktivinod thakur you see him on the altar he explains that because of difference in his book chaitanya shikshamrit he says five factors that because of which there are differences in different religions there are differences in the prophet specifically who come and give god's message there are differences in the mentalities of people uh, to whom that message is given there are differences in the cultural and social atmospheres where that message is given there are differences in language and there are differences in understandings which are passed over over generations so like that this is the whole subject why there are differences but he says that essentially it is the one message of god that is passed down through the various religions of the world so god is not the monopoly of any religion god and god's wisdom is the common grace or for is the common inheritance common legacy for all of humanity and now some religions may in their current expressions be more open minded and some may be less open minded that varies depending on how those religions are understood and how those religions are presented when shri prabhupad went all over the world in his advanced age sharing krishna consciousness thought with people all over the world he actually presented a very broad minded understanding when christian priests came to him and they asked him you know what are your thoughts about jesus so prabhupad said jesus is our guru he was surprised guru he says how is this you know he had so much love for god that he was ready to lay down his life for the service of god such love of god is extraordinary one who has such love of god is actually our guru so and shri prabhu asked then is what you are teaching the same as what jesus taught prabhu said essentially is the same then why have you come to teach us prabhu said because you have forgotten it <laughs> when krishna describes in the fourth chapter of the bhagavad gita sakalene hamata yogo nashta parantapa that by the passage of time that spiritual process that legacy that wisdom which god has given that gets lost that 
actually applies to all traditions now it can apply to the vedic tradition it can apply to the uh, christian tradition it can apply to the muslim tradition it can apply to jewish tradition that by the power of time things decline things get distorted so that's why there has to be a periodic revival resurgence and when there is a deeper contemplation then there is proper understanding otherwise when people are simply religious then they think this is my way and that is your way and both of us are on two opposite ways so it's like you know imagine uh, i'll give one more example and i'll conclude and then we can have question answers suppose uh, if we look at spiritual and material as states of consciousness states of being so religion is the process by which i can rise from the material state of being to the spiritual state of being so now the material state of being is like the diseased state of being it is why is it considered diseased because at this level we have to suffer death and we have to suffer so many problems because of the anxieties of this world the spiritual state is like the healthy state so now just as in the world also if a person is sick and a person wants to get healthy there can be different therapies that can cure the person some people can take allopathy some will take naturopathy some will take homeopathy some will take ayurveda there are different treatments now the important thing is about a treatment is whether it cures the person isn't it imagine if one particular medical stream it says you know our way is the only way and because we are right so what we will do is we will destroy all other doctors allopathy is the only right way so we'll destroy allop ayurvedic clinics we will kill ayurvedic doctors you know this is fanaticism but so the, what is the test is if by following a particular process a person gets cured or not if a person actually becomes detached from undesirable material things no there are many things which are undesirable even from material point of view no people become intoxicated and when they become intoxicated what happens you know they just waste their money so much now russia ussr was the uh, one of the countries in the world where atheism was tried on a nationwide scale and russia ussr was the biggest country in the world so uh, officially religion was persecuted and religious practitioners were executed so in such a situation what happened with no capac no facility for experiencing anything higher people what do people do you know they have to get some some kind of relief from the emptiness and the boredom of life so and most of us are was poor so they would just drink vodka you know they would drink and drink so there was when russia started getting uh, when perestroika started and ussr the communist regime started disintegrating now there was a propaganda uh, flyer that was made so you know what was the state of the people over there no so the government in order to bolster its economy would periodically increase the price of vodka so you know the, the fa- father is there in the family and the uh, son they they come to know that the price of vodka has increased so the son asks his father father will you drink less now the father says no you will eat less now <laughs> so this is so tragic so actually people are so desperate for something higher that you know they, they may even deprive others even their own loved ones of their necessity so that they can get some higher experience now actually whatever alcohol and things like that they give some high experience but after that they cause so many so much trouble so these are the, so alcoholism or int or smoking or things like that these are even material undesirable and when people are too materially attached to it they hurt themselves they hurt others so if one is becoming spiritual these mat- at least these materially undesirable things should go away one should break be able to break free from these things if somebody says i am a spiritualist and that person is addicted to alcohol addicted to drugs and addicted to so many things materialistic and then how can you really give credence to that person's being spiritual so we can't have just sentimentally saying that 
or whatever you believe is spiritual is spiritual. See, one extreme, as I said, is narrow-mindedness, where if suppose a Ayurvedic clinic, as an allopathic clinic person says that all other clinics should be destroyed. Radha Gopinath Bhagavan Ki. The other extreme is to be open-minded. Okay, you know, every building is a hospital. No, every idea is a pathy. Some pathy it is. Some kind of treatment it is. We have to be open-minded, but we can't be so open-minded that our brain falls out. <laughs> is it it? If people think that, but anything is spiritual, then what will happen? Nobody will actually be spiritual. Because nobody will be following a process of transformation by which people can become spiritual. So, there is an objective criteria. Bhakti Pareshanu Bhava Virakti Ranyatra Cha. The Bhagavatam says that where there is genuine spiritual experience, there is bhakti, then what happens? There are two characteristics. There is one internal characteristic and one external characteristic. The internal characteristic is Para Isha Anubhav. One experiences God. Para Isha. Isha is God. A para is one who is transcendental. He cannot be experienced in any other way. But he's experienced through devotion. And when he's experienced in this way, what happens? Virakti Ranyatracha. One becomes detached from other experiences. The experience of God is so fulfilling that one doesn't need other uh, titillating or even destructive material experiences. So the, so the inner symptom is that we are experiencing God. The outer system is we don't crave for sensual worldly experiences. And in this way, this is actual spirituality. That we rise to a higher level of consciousness where we find happiness within ourselves in our connection with God. Srila Prabhupada gave a simple definition. Who is a spiritualist? One who finds happiness internally. And but who is a materialist? One who seeks happiness externally. So we focus on becoming spiritual and religion is a means by which we can become spiritual. So by practicing religion, it should make us spiritual. It should not make us narrow-minded. And so, literally speaking, is it possible to be spiritual without being religious? Actually speaking, if we mean by being spiritual, open-minded, religious, close-minded, yes, we all want to be spiritual, but not religious. But practically speaking, this is a summary of the class now, we discussed that, spiritual means it's a state of consciousness. And that has to be attained. And religion is the process by which it is to be attained. If people forget the purpose of religion to rise to a spiritual level of consciousness, then religion can become a tool for just sentimental blind belief. It can become a tool for intolerance and violence also. We discussed that version of religion is what? Pay, pray, obey. There is not much contemplation involved. But the Vedic scriptures describe religion as what? Analyze, realize and cherish. Analyze. Okay, We discussed where do I get my longing to be immortal come from in a world which is mortal? And then we turn towards scripture. God has provided everything for living, will he not provide knowledge for living? And then we learn about our spiritual identity and we learn a process by which we can rise to that spiritual level. And we discussed about how if you're too caught up in a movie, the way to come out is switch off the movie and then turn on the other lights. Like that, detach ourselves from material things and attach ourselves to spiritual things and this happens organically as one grows and then we discussed about how there is a process for doing this so in, in spirituality there is philosophy and there is a religion so philosophy is like the theory aspect of science religion is like the experiment aspect um, and then lastly we discussed about how when we talk about medicine there is a healthy state and there is a sick state and there can be many more ways to move from the sick state to the healthy state but it's not that anything that one does, it will make one healthy. One has to check whether one is becoming healthy or not. So similarly, there can be many religions which are revealed by God according to time, place, circumstance. The test is whether one is becoming spiritual or not. And to the extent one becomes detached from material things and becomes attached to spiritual things, to the extent one can experience inner peace, just as a boat with an anchor doesn't get shaken, and we can experience inner happiness. And that actually is being spiritual. So when we chant, when we come to the temple, 
we are not just being religious in the sense of being narrow minded or ritualistic for us religion is a process by which we come to the spiritual level of consciousness so devotees if you want we are, we are not narrow minded so in that sense we are spiritual but not religious but in the sense that we recognize spirituality is not just some sentimental imagination it's a state that has to be attained so in that sense we are religious we follow a process by which we can become spiritual so thank you very much are there any questions yes please Hare Krishna Prabhu, Dandar Pranam, I have. Yes. Well, firstly, thank you very much for the wonderful discourse. And also for the spiritualscientist.com, it is really helpful in all ways. And I have a question, like I was uh, reading the book, Idol Worship or Idol Worship. So in that, in that uh, you said like, um, if idol is so dirty, and if, I mean, God cannot come into the idol, so it again overlaps the feature of God's omnipotence. And again, I have a doubt like uh, when similarly a non-devotee chants, so it becomes, uh, we say like uh, uh, it is corrupted or when, uh, when, non, when we listen to Maha Mantra or uh, from the mouth of a non-devotee, uh, it becomes poisonous. So how does we equate this thing? Okay. So your question is, if God is omnipotent, then, and yet we say that, we shouldn't hear the chanting of the holy names or we shouldn't hear Krishna Katha from a non-devotee because that becomes contaminated. So how can some human beings uh, contamination affect God's sound? Actually, it is not that God who is affected. It is what is coming to us is affected. It's just like now, there can be a huge dam with unlimited amount of water. But if there is one hole through which it is coming out, one pipe through which it is coming out, and then that pipe is contaminated, then it's not that the full dam is contaminated, but the water that will come out from that pipe is contaminated. So same way, God is pure. But when a particular human being speaks about God, but that person has a a self-centered understanding that that person say things that I am God. I'm just giving an extreme example. There was a spiritual teacher who said that, you know, I have not come to tell you that you should worship God. I have, there are other teachers who came to say that. There are there's, there's some other teachers who said that I am God. I have not even come to tell you that. He says, I have come to tell you that you are God. <laughs> So this is so titillating for the false ego to think, you know, oh, I am God, very good. good. Very good. I am God and I have just realized I am God. So that means God had forgotten and somebody else apart from God had to remind God, you are God. <laughs> so then that we ask the question, how did God forget anything at all? So the simple point is that it is not that God is contaminated ever, but what comes to us because it is coming through a particular channel, that which comes to us gets contaminated. And even that contamination, we have to understand, is in a context. We have Everything has to be seen from the fuller. If something takes us closer to Krishna or something takes us away from Krishna. So for example, if somebody has never heard anything about Krishna and then somebody sees, uh, say, a movie about Krishna or some picture about Krishna, and that may have been prepared by a non-devotee. But if that creates a curiosity, what is this Krishna, what is this Bhagavad I want to find out. And that, that brings a person closer to Krishna, that is good. But this is talked about especially for those who are already serious seekers of Krishna. For them, the primary focus is to try to purify their consciousness further. And then, if we hear from those who are pure or those who are aspiring to be pure, then that pure consciousness comes to us further. But if we hear from others, then what happens is Krishna is omnipotent. 
but the channels contamination comes not on krishna but on what is coming to us so that is uh, the uh, for especially for serious seekers they should be selective about whom they hear from because that will depend determine how much they become purified or not see it is said for the initial stages anyway you think of krishna that is good yena kena prakarena mana krishna nivesh somehow or other remember krishna but as we advance it is said that yes we should remember krishna but in a way that pleases him you know anukulena krishna no shilanam bhakti ruttama bhakti is it is that which pleases krishna so there are stages so initially it is to uh, in, initially any way a person comes to know about krishna that may be good but for serious seekers we want to come to know about krishna in a way which actually takes us closer to krishna is there answer your question yes thank you yes there behind okay okay people don't want to be religious because there are so many don'ts uh, like restriction it starts from day like no tea no garlic no onion no mixing with girls can we can we be spiritual with all these things <laughs> see the focus in spirituality the focus in spirituality is not on saying no it is on saying yes suppose a person wants to become a champion cricketer now if we want excellence in any field there has to be a focus that borders on the fanatical somebody says i want to be a cricketer today i will play cricket tomorrow i'll play football day after tomorrow i'll play hockey next day i will play chess next day i'll play carrom and after one year i'll become a champion cricketer it's not going to work you know even in material life if you want to achieve excellence in something we have to focus on that thing and if the person wants to become a good cricketer is that person thinking oh i can't play football i can't play tennis i can't play carrom i can't play chess that's not what is thinking about what is he thinking about yes, i want to become a champion cricketer so when we practice spirituality you know we have to understand what is our purpose and as we start feeling the charm of krishna as we start experiencing the joy of krishna consciousness then we will start feeling other things to be unnecessary irrelevant so we should if we are initially starting spirituality we should not worry too much of what what i have to give up rather we can ask the question there are so many young people just like me what are they getting that they are ready to give up all these things just turn the question around you know why would in, if you meet with spiritual people if you meet with devotees you know if you talk with them there is you will find that most of what they say does make sense so you will see these people are intelligent why, if they are giving up they are saying no to so many things why are they saying no There, there must be something that they are getting because of which they are saying no to these things. They are able to say no to these things. So we can try to inquire what that is. And once we get a taste for that, then saying no to those things will happen organically. So we shouldn't bother too much about what all I'll have to give up. Our focus should be what all I will get. The whole process of bhakti is not of saying no; it is of saying yes. When we say yes to Krishna. the krishna either things other than krishna they move aside and it is not that as devotees for as uh, people who are considering practice of devotion it is not that the nose are of primary importance although first appearance it may seem like that okay you have to give up this you have to give up this you have to give up that no the focus is we experience krishna and as i said when we experience krishna we feel many things is unnecessary and actually speaking when you talk about many of the things which are talking about no tea and things like that now many of these things are not even materially desirable you know tea you know it may be a some sort of stimulant but if you look at it from a long term point of view it is not really very good for health in many ways it is known to be harmful and as far as say relationship with the opposite sex is concerned it is not that that is to be rejected no there is a proper way to do that 
and yes you can have a you can get married and there is grahastha ashram but today's culture where there is free mixing actually even materially there may be some titillation some enjoyment but it leads to so much complication last time when i had given prerna i had quoted uh, a book from a book called american paradox by american sociologist and he said you know where is this culture of freedom you know anybody can do whatever you want you can have a relationship with anyone eat anything drink anything all this where does it lead to so actually just recent history of america from 1940s onwards to 2000 if you look at america what has happened that the divorce rate has doubled the depression rate has tripled the suicide rate has quadrupled the prison population has quintupled the number of babies born out of marriage has sextupled and the number of people attempting suicide you know the number of people who commit successful suicide you know that we talked about earlier but the number sheer number of people attempting suicide has gone more than 10 times so this whole idea of freedom freedom it actually doesn't lead to freedom you know we have only one idea of freedom see there is there are two kinds of freedom there is freedom for and there is freedom from so today society glamorizes the freedom for freedom for means the freedom for eating the freedom for mating freedom for doing this freedom for doing that but that is not the only way, idea of freedom there is another kind of freedom that is freedom from freedom from greed freedom from lust freedom from anger freedom for will not bring us as much happiness as freedom from you know we may not suppose a person is a alcoholic addict then for that person you know, everything reminds of alcohol you know everything you know just think about drinking drinking and person is, if a person is trying to recover it's so difficult because there are so many things which keep reminding that person so somebody who is not an alcoholic addict that person has no craving only so is that person is free from that so freedom from freedom from greed you know every single thing that is advertised you know i want to purchase it i want to eat it i want to enjoy it it actually becomes sickening it becomes tiring so you know it was mentioned that i write an article on the geeta every day so today morning only i wrote the article those who make pleasure the purpose of their life make their life purposeless those who make pleasure the purpose of their life i want this i want this i want this because i enjoy it enjoy it afterwards that enjoyment becomes boring and according to a survey in america how people spend their lives now 5% of the time of their life they are happy 5% of the time of their life they are miserable and 90% they are bored <laughs> bored why because if sensual enjoyment is the only enjoyment that we know about then if i want to eat and enjoy out of 24 hours how much can i eat you know i can't eat 24 hours mm. if i think that sex is the source of enjoyment in 24 hours how much can a person do that activity for a few minutes and when i when if that kind of enjoyment is the only idea of enjoyment that we have when we don't have that enjoyment then what is there left life is boring so there are more refined ways of getting happiness and freedom for is not the only way of freedom spirituality talks about freedom from when we are free from lust when we are free from greed when we are free from anger then we can connect with krishna internally and we can experience higher happiness so don't worry about what you have to give up think what others are getting and you are missing because of which they are giving up all these things and be eager to explore that yes. any other questions yeah Okay. good question so if religion is the means to become spiritual then is there a time when we will be religious 
we will become spiritual and so we won't need religion anymore not exactly because when we become spiritual what is as it means spiritual actually spiritual is a relationship the so as souls we have a relationship with god with krishna and that relationship is active it's dynamic it's ever flowing and in that relationship we act so right now we may chant the holy names because as it is a sadhana it will purify us but as we become purified then the holy name is the way we express our love for krishna and the holy name is the way by which we experience krishna's love for us so at that level it will be a way by which we reciprocate love so go back to the medicine or health metaphor you know ritually religion is like the sadhana it's like the medicine that we take but it is so wonderful that as we become cured we realize that what we were treating as a medicine is actually the most relishable nectar so then we take it not because the doctor has prescribed it then we take it because we enjoy it so it's not that we go beyond religious activities it's just that our motivation for doing religious activities changes we we do them because we spontaneously like to do them we have a loving relationship with krishna and that's why we do those activities so there are some other conceptions of spirituality where people think that you know religion is just like a tool you practice religion and then when you become god then you give up religion but the bhagavad gita tells us we never become god we are parts of god and to recognize that we are parts to realize that we are parts then when that is what we do by religion and then we actually get the lasting fulfillment and then we do that because of love for krishna so there is fear desire duty and love so the religious activities can be done because of fear oh god will punish me so i should do it desire maybe god will pass me in my exam so let me come to the temple let me desire there is duty i understand i have a relationship with god let me serve him and then there is love so when we come to the level of love it's a way to express our relationship with him that's why we do those activities so it's not that we go beyond religion but what does happen is that as we become more and more spiritual we understand god's grace and greatness more and then we can appreciate spirituality in other places also bhaktivinod thakur says in one of his prayers let's say if we go to a a, a, temp, a mosque or a church or some other place where god is being worshiped in a way that is different from how we are worshiping him then what should be our thought he said we should not we should think that my that my worshipful god has manifested himself in a different way to attract different kinds of people so i am inspired i am touched to see how merciful god is in reaching out to different people and i pray to that lord who is so merciful that he bestow his mercy on me and make me attracted to him more in the form in which i know him so we appreciate when we become spiritual more and more we appreciate other spirituality more and more but that doesn't mean we give up our path it's just like uh, if i am sick and i become healthy the important thing is that the medicine is not just something which is transitional as i said the medicine itself becomes the source of joy afterwards initially the source of healing nivritta tarshai rupagiyamana bhav aushada chrotra mano bhiramat so what is bhav aushadi initially it eventually becomes mano bhiramat it becomes the source of joy eventually and that's how we practice constantly clear yes hari krishna prabhu ji uh, we we all know most of us at least that you are a great writer also and you have been writing so much to inspire the youth would you like to share some of your own experiences that how a person should go who wants to write himself you know if a devotee who is a writer how should he write how should he go about it and what is the impact of uh, when you write on the society and how to you know get it published uh, you know things about writing so so all of us you know may go in that direction also because shila prabhupad wanted us to write okay <laughs> so i appreciate the question at the same time i feel that those who aspire to be writers will be in a microscopic minority over here 
So I will just answer it very briefly. And I'm planning to do a, a writing course online. How devotees can write. In the next two, three months, I'll be doing that. So if you visit my site, you'll come to know about it. But briefly, writing is basically talking on paper. It's not something which is mysterious. It is just talking on paper. So, especially with the interactivity that has come up because of the internet, that talking has become easier. That is good and bad also. It is bad because anybody can talk anything and can go everywhere in the world. And there can be so much uh, uh, meaningless uh, gossip that can spread. But it can be good because we can reach to people and we can get... Uh, we can share Krishna's message. We can have interactions much more easily. So I would say, first point is to demystify writing. It is simply conversation on paper. Second point is that writing is much more difficult than a normal conversation because we can't see the people whom we are writing to. So therefore, whatever potential misunderstandings they may have, whatever doubts they may have, all those we have to anticipate, address and deal with. That's why it has to be done much more carefully. And as far as reaching out is concerned, as far as, so how to write, why to write, uh, I have written a full article on my website, Five Reasons to Write in Devotional Service. It's called uh, the acronym write, W-R-I-T-E. Uh, write, W is worship. We can worship Krishna with words who are writing. R is reflection. We can contemplate and realize things better. I is introspection. We can do it for our own inner search for inner realization. T is therapy. Our writing can help us to heal ourselves. And E is explanation. We can explain uh, Krishna's message to others. So I won't go into this all this in detail. But suffice it to say that it's a very powerful way in which we can reach out to a large number of people. So through my writing, you know, I have connected with people all over the world. There are devotees, in, or potential devotees in Russia, in Australia, in America. You know, they write mails to me, I answer their questions, they suggest topics for writing. So I feel we can create a virtual community of spiritual seekers and we can serve them through writing. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur did that in his times. No, at that time there was no internet, but that time the printing press had just come. So he actually had a whole community of devo devotees through his magazines. So every magazine article that he would write, oh, that's how many people would be spiritually nourished. So we can actually uh, receive Krishna as we have received from our senior devotees and share it with others. And that's how we can utilize, dovetail this writing in Krishna's service. And writing is actually a very intense form of remembrance of Krishna. Because at that time, it's very difficult. As Prabhupada says in one lecture, that in one letter to Satsuru Maharaj, that words are the best way to save us from forgetting Krishna. Because when we have to write, we have to think very carefully about our words. So he said, therefore, he said, in fact, he recommended all devotees to write. He said, one sentence, two sentences, write something. What do you realize about Krishna? Writing a personal diary can help us to make, uh, take stock of our spiritual advancement. Sometimes when we feel very irritated, very depressed, we want someone to share our heart with. And if there is no one, we just write it in a diary find our mind will calm down. And then we can look back. Okay, what did I write? Why did I feel like that? I got so disturbed at that time. There's no need to go so disturbed. So for our own healing, as well as for sharing Krishna with others, writing can be a valuable tool. Okay. Any other questions? Why is it that one religion conflicts completely with other religions to a path of devotion to God, like killing animals in name of God, beef eating, etc.? Actually, it is not that one religion conflicts another. It is that that which is contextual is assumed, mistaken to be universal. That is contextual means that which is told at a particular place, at a particular time, if that is absolutized and made universal for everyone, then that is what leads to conflicts. So, if you see certain religions, they start developed in desert areas where grains were not there. So that's why meat was allowed. In fact, meat was also recommended. But if we look deep within even those religions, for example, if we talk about Islam, you know, I have some friends who are, we have like an interfaith conference. So I have a, a Muslim friend who is a vegetarian. And he's written a full book about how there are so many references in the Quran, then in the... Uh, 
subsequent writings of the Muslim scholars and saints that, you know, where it is possible, one should show compassion and avoid meat eating. Now, be vegetarian. But what was told at that context, at that particular time, it is absolutized. Now, even as far as beef eating is concerned, it is not like an absolute principle within that religion. It is. There are so many countries in the world, if you go to Malaysia, Indonesia, or even the Middle East, no, there are there are many places where there are no cows available. So there is so actually most there are people do not necessarily slaughter cows and eat beef. So is it that all the places all over the world where people are not killing cows, they cannot be Muslims? No, somehow there has been a lot of uh, misleading and exploitation of people, along with of course misunderstanding of the root scripture because of which. Religious propaganda, because of which our communal feelings have been uh, triggered. And if there is a calmer, saner discussion, these sort of uh, misunderstandings can be resolved. So there are definitely differences in religions. Just as I said, there are differences between different therapies, between Ayurveda and Allopathy. But the important point is that their purpose is similar. And different religions may be less or more useful at different times in fulfilling their purpose. So as devotees, we focus on practicing ourselves and sharing what we have got with others. And as we raise ourselves to a higher level of consciousness, you know, we can help others also so to see things from a higher perspective and then we can avoid conflicts. Play our part in avoiding conflicts. Is there any other questions? Proji. Yeah. Actually, it is with relation to this particular question actually. So, as uh, we know that there are different religions with different conception of their followings, so can this religions, different religion, can survive and exist in same premises? Actually, can different religions survive in the same premises? It depends on who is practicing it and why they are practicing it. So, you know, in every religion, there are narrow-minded people and there are broad-minded people. So the important point is, you know, it's not necessary also that all religions have to agree on everything. But it's important to recognize that there are truths which are valid and people have found them meaningful. See, there are, two, there are two extremes. You know, some people just demonize other religions. You know, all other religions are bad. And others try to romanticize, you know, all of us will all religions stay happily together. You know, actually, there are so many other divisions. You know, there's a division based on race, there's a division based on nationality, there's a division based on state. Uh, so there are so many divisions like that. And how often do people, with all these divisions, always live cordially? It's not necessary that they will live cordially. So we don't necessarily have to emphasize cordial living among different religious communities. What we should emphasize is spiritual living. So the more people become spiritual, more they will be able to live cordially. So our focus, when Srila Prabhupada was asked about this, you know, he said that what we should focus on is on raising our own consciousness. And in principle, yes, if the different religious practitioners understand that our purpose is ultimately to love God, and God can offer himself in different ways, then it's possible for them to live cordially. But we shouldn't worry about what is not in our power. What is in our power is to transform ourselves, to elevate ourselves and to share the method by which others can elevate themselves. So if we can do that, then overall we contribute to raising the consciousness of humanity. And you know, there are three modes. There is, you know, there is goodness, there is passion, there is ignorance. So sattva guna, rajaguna, tamaguna. And when people are rajasic and tamasic in the mode of passion and ignorance, they will fight whatever be the reason. You know, religious conflicts come in the highlight, but actually there are conflicts over everything. You know, if you see most the World War One, World War Two, it was not because of religion. Territorial conflicts, power conflicts. So as long as people are in the mode of passion and ignorance, they are going to fight. And as people come to the mode of goodness, the fightings will decrease. So rather than stressing the point that People with different religions live harmoniously. What should, be, what should be stressed is, whatever religion people are practicing, they practice it in such a way that they rise to the higher modes. If they rise to goodness, then there is a possibility of living harmoniously. 
So only when there is, Prabhupada would say that there is no use of crying for world peace without the awakening of divine consciousness in the individual. Only when there is awakening of divine consciousness in the individual, then there is the possibility of world peace. So we focus on awakening that divine consciousness in ourselves and in others to whatever capacity we have for sharing. Yes? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, Prabhuji, I wanted to ask, in today's time, how do we reach that uh, spiritual state even after chanting? Because when we come to temple and we chant, we do feel something. But after going out of temple, minds again get unstable and filled with anxiety. So how to deal with it? Yes, so how do we stay spiritual when we go out of the temple to non-spiritual places? Yes, it's a process. Just like when we take medicines, we gradually become cured. But cure is not an overnight process. It's a gradual process. So wherever we go, we have to be careful what we are exposing ourselves to. It's not that everything around us is totally materialistic. Even if you go to college, you'll find, or we go to workplace, we'll find that it's not that everybody is totally materialistic. There are some people who are maybe a little bit more in the mode of goodness. They like some kind of regulated living. And there are others who may be totally materialistic. Some people who may be atheistic. So wherever social circle we are in, we can make those choices that are relatively conducive for our spiritual life. It may not be directly we'll have association of devotees everywhere. But we can choose those things which are least hostile to our spiritual life. And that way we can protect ourselves. And most importantly is that when we practice spirituality, we try to take spiritual impressions within us. We chant intensely, we study the scriptures intensely and understand those principles. And as we understand them more and more, then wherever we go, we'll be able to carry that presence with us. It's, it's a gradual thing. And you know, we expect some the growth to be sudden and rapid. But it is a gradual growth. You know, simply the fact that we are asking this question itself indicates that our values have changed. Indicate that we are valuing spirituality and we are concerned about how we can protect spiritual, our spirituality. This was not the case a few months ago or a few years ago. So that ins- indicates a, a, a spiritual advancement in one sense. So focus on trying to take wholehearted association and wholehearted Krishna conscious impressions while we are in spiritual environment. And then we have to go to material environment. Then choose that sort of circumstance, that sort of friend circle uh, which is least anti-spiritual. And that way we can continue in a spiritually healthy way. Okay. Yes? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, being elections round in the corner, there are many political leaders who use religion for their word bank politics. And also there are many spiritual leaders who sometimes come out in support of such political leaders. So being living in such a society when we are pursuing Krishna consciousness, so uh, what is the best way to strive in such a environment, especially in, in the society like India, where are you know so many people, even in Hindus or even in you know in devotee circle, we may find some people who may be politically inclined with some leaders. But as as you said, the sole objective of spiritualism is to get connected with Krishna, and religion is the purpose for that. So how to, uh, you know, uh, concentrate on our spiritual activities more than getting inf- infected with the political scenarios? Okay. So when there is politically surcharged environments because of elections, and should devotees get involved in it? Or how can we stay uh, uh, unaffected by it? Spirituality is not just about rejecting the world. It is about connecting the world with Krishna also. So, at one level we can say we are unconcerned about society, but at another level we have to live in the society also. So, the, if the society is governed by forces that are anti-spiritual, uh, uh, that is going to affect us adversely. So, if we can be a part, we can contribute in some way towards creating a socio-political, socio-cultural environment that is less hostile to spirituality, that is more uh, receptive to spirituality, then we can do our part. But that will vary upon, uh, vary with individual to individual. 
so some devotees if they already have a lot of interest in politics and they had political aspirations it's not that because they are devotees they have to give it up but they can they can consider that this is what i am doing uh, i'll try to do it in such a way that okay i'll see if there are certain political parties which are we are not concerned with one party or another party we are concerned with values so if one party supports values that are more spiritual another party supports values that are less spiritual then our support will be for the values and then accordingly we can support a particular party or a particular set of values and whichever party supports that values but if uh, somebody would feel okay this is this is never my interest and there is no need for me to get interested in it so the important thing is that we recognize that devotees are not just socially unconscious or socially oblivious of the social realities no i mean there are countries in the world where there are governments which do not allow the practice of devotional service at all so uh, there you cannot be indifferent to the government if in india in the future such a government comes up it will be difficult for us to practice also so we cannot say that oh we are not concerned with the government at all there are many places where government is concerned about us <laughs> is it no in fact the devo in when the communism was in its last days in ussr so the, the last head of kgb he said you know that these hare krishnas he said american music american culture and hare krishnas these are three threats to communism <laughs> so <laughs> so they were concerned so we shouldn't have to be too worried about it but we are not unconcerned in the sense that we are irresponsible so it will depend on individual inclination those who feel inspired that okay through politics we can make a change we can do that so the prabhupada was not averse to that but uh, he said that it's not necessary for all devotees in america and australia prabhupada inspired devotees to start a political party he called it in god we trust party and prabhupada said that you talk about the principles of god consciousness so he was not averse to that but at the same time it's not that he said oh devotees there's no need to chant and dance all of you start a political party and enter politics no those devotees who already had that interest they approach prabhupada prabhupada said yes do it so bhakti is not about suppressing our own interests or our own natures especially if they are not anti devotional entirely but it is not that we have to deliberately get involved when we had no interest in it so if we have interest don't tell that answer your question yes okay mm. okay in the era of mass deception when most government political systems are endorsing atheism and we are socially and culturally for god and we are socially and culturally forced into materialism then how do we focus on spirituality or religion actually yes this is a age of materialism but there is the relief which is provided by krishna himself this is kali yuga beyond whatever political socio cultural situations are there whatever media is there is kali yuga and kali yuga is a age of materialism that's what the scriptures themselves tell but as if there are rains we may not be able to stop the rains but we can have an umbrella and by that umbrella we can protect ourselves so the process of bhakti yoga and especially the process of chanting of the holy names is like the umbrella which can protect us by which we can protect ourselves so we focus not so much on what the world is doing so you know what is happening in the world is not as important as what is happening in our heart so if we are convinced that yes i want to practice spirituality then no matter how difficult the circumstances we can practice and by our example we can inspire others to practice like i was telling about uh, the go- russian go- uh, the com- soviet government opposing you know, there were devotees who were persecuted who were tortured who were um, physically maimed mentally um, harassed but still they kept practicing devotion service and this is not something which happened only in russia the bhagavatam talks about it prahlad maharaj you know hiranyakashipu was such a materialist isn't it and in fact you know he had not only control over the media he had control over the universe <laughs> but even in that environment prahlad maharaj was practicing krishna uh, bhakti and what happened he inspired others to practice also so we have to remember that beyond 
all our social realities is the spiritual reality of Krishna. And Krishna will never put us in a situation where we can't practice spiritual life. He will never make it impossible for us to practice spiritual life. But it may not always be possible for us to practice spiritual life in the way we would like to practice. So, we'll have to find out in different situations, we can practice in different ways. Just as a river always moves towards the ocean, like that, we find out new ways to move towards Krishna. We improvise. And that is where the devotional creativity comes up. How we can practice Krishna consciousness in the material environment, in our particular environment, that each of us can use our individual creativity and find that out. And in fact, that can make our own devotional life also adventurous. It can make it exciting and fulfilling. How in my particular environment, how can I remember Krishna? How can I serve Krishna? You know, Yudhishthir Maharaj, he had to fight a war. And by fighting the war, he became the world emperor and then he glorified Krishna thereof. He did not think, oh, I, what do I get into the business of fighting a war and establishing and defeating so many people? I'll just uh, be happy remembering Krishna. No, no, he got involved, but through that he glorified Krishna. So each of us, if we have the desire to glorify Krishna, Krishna will guide us. And we will find out ways in which, even in situations where nobody seems to be interested, we will find out some people are interested. And then through that, not only will our spirituality be protected, but we will be able to share spirituality with so many other people. I will conclude with just one story. Probably many of you know about it. Some other preachers may have told about it. There was one a devotee who was in a hostel and he thought, oh, this hostel is filled with all materialistic people. So, if I chant, people will laugh at me. So, every morning he would wake up and he would chant secretly under his blanket. You know? <laughs> and as he chanted under his blanket and then one day he saw some suspicious movement on his room partner's bed and he's wondering, what is this happening? And he observed first day, second day, third day he saw that this person also seems to be awake. And after several days, one day just his curiosity got the better of him. He just went there and took off the blanket. And that person was also a devotee. He was chanting secretly, thinking this person would laugh. <laughs> so who knows? We don't have to assume the worst about others. We just practice the best that we can and Krishna will send us allies in whatever situation we are. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhakti Bhanda Ki. Hare Krishna. So, we like to Thank His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu for taking out his valuable time for spending such on such an important topic. I was just feeling that many of us were religious but without being spiritual. Today Prabhuji has balanced those who are spiritual and not religious. So both both he has joined. So let us thank His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu by loudly chanting. Riva! Riva! So our next prerna will be on uh, June 21st. Many of our uh, leaders, the IWS boys who later became senior grahasthas, they are traveling all over the world, giving uh, seminars all over the world. So we realize